So Anud is the chief strategy officer at Cisco. Uh, I run into him every so often uh, at the coffee shop uh, near the house and uh, somehow talked him into uh, coming and uh, giving a talk here. Thanks very much. Yeah, before it. Uh, that's, that's good. <laughs> and uh, Amit, uh, I, I approached Anuj and he says, Yeah, I know Amit. Do you really want him on stage? I said, Absolutely. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 So if you know uh, if you know Amit uh, and follow him on Twitter, you will see that he's everywhere. He's uh, he's a very busy man, and if you follow me on Twitter, you're one of seven and a half followers I have. Uh, and you know, so it's a pleasure to be hosting you. I actually know Amit personally, so we're going to try to not laugh at each other as we uh, try to pretend to be formal. But uh, we'll probably do ten minutes of prepared remarks and then ten minutes of Q and A. We'd love to find out what's top of mind for you, and uh, in general how we can get you on Google Cloud and using Cisco Access Points. Um, good product so, pitch. Yeah. So, Amit, uh, and maybe we'll just share this. Um, talk to us about applications. What's going on? Why are they important? And why the renewed focus on, on them? All right. That's better. No, thanks thanks uh, for being here. And good to hang out with you like this. Uh, so, I think on the application side, and just to give you a background of my, on my, myself, uh, I have been in the middleware and application development space for the last 25 years. Uh, previously, uh, before Google, I was at Oracle building a middleware platform. And uh, we had, of course, thousands and thousands of developers who build on top of that. And at Google Cloud, we're building a platform again for developers to be able to build uh, next generation applications. I think there's a huge amount of changes going on, uh, as many of you guys might be noticing. And I think the three key areas which at least I kind of see the trends in one is around the professional developers. I think the professional developers are going through a huge amount of changes and their life has become very difficult. Right? You have distributed architectures, you have a lot of new technologies like Kubernetes, Istio, and things you have to pick up from open source or other package providers. As well as now the idea of CICD and having agile development and a distributed organization, it becomes very complicated to be able to build applications. So requiring tools and capabilities and be able to figure out what pieces of stack to use and which one you can depend on is a very complicated and a very difficult uh, uh, endeavor for a lot of these professional developers. So that's, I think, the one big trend I see in terms of what changes they have to go through versus the way you used to build before. You had a good set of middleware technologies, package capabilities. You just write code on top of it, and everything else gets monolithically kind of running someplace. Second change is really the non-professional developers, which is becoming a big trend now. We're seeing a huge amount of line of business developers and analysts and semi-professional in a way, citizen developers, whatever you want to call them. But they're becoming a large force of uh, development now and building next generation applications as well. So they're now looking for tooling and capabilities to very easily build these applications or extend an existing application without having to call IT or a professional developer uh, to go and uh, do that work. So that's a big area of now innovation happening as well as requirements coming in. And third thing is, I think, big thing is around deployment. So that typically what we see with uh, application developers, they used to build an application, give it to somebody to run and manage it. Uh, now the developers have to do it themselves, right? So you have to having to learn about different, arc different infrastructures, b different places you want to run it, uh, as well as be able to manage it, debug it, and operate it. So you're going, going away from a software engineer to be also an operational person. So that's a big change for the f uh, kind of the background you look for now as an engineer versus what we used to typically do. Can you write code? Great, hire them. Now you have to worry about can you also operate and be available to debug uh, for all the issues customers might face eventually when you deploy this application. Yeah, this notion of the full stack operator or what's known as you operate what you build. Yeah. That's great. So I think the question for you was really how would you kind of do this thing, the infrastructure, what are the changes you're seeing from the distributed infrastructure perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. So you know, one of the greatest lines, uh, there's two lines I use when I talk to CIOs. Uh, the first is software doesn't run on software. So we still need hardware. Um, and the second is your applications may live in the cloud, but your users rarely do. Right. So the physical environment matters. I think what we're talking about here is the infrastructure that serves applications as opposed to the infrastructure that serves users, which is where we are right now. And uh, our lens of the world starts below the application tier from service management all the way up to infrastructure orchestration. And when you look at that layer cake, and you know, Gartner, IDC, and others define it differently, 
but there's probably three or four key layers. The service management, there is uh, application monitoring, there's infrastructure monitoring, and there's infrastructure orchestration. Uh, we think that's about a $31 billion market. Uh, that is going through significant reconstitution. And the reason it's going through the reconstitution is for the things that you actually highlighted, which is an application is no longer an application. It's a series of microservices that come together in runtime in a containerized environment that may actually live in an ephemeral infrastructure construct of, uh, of Lambda. Um, and then developers are no longer developers, right? This notion of the evolution of the developer to a full stack owner and operator, and increasingly someone that's responsible for operationalizing the complexity that they create uh, is a big thing. I think the stat that uh, we like to use a lot is, how many of you use, uh, use the internet? <laughs> right, a few of you. So I'm assuming some of you also have Netflix accounts, and you don't need to admit, I know it's recorded, but how many of you have individual Netflix accounts that you pay for as opposed to from family members. Every time you lo load up a Netflix homepage, um, there's about 25 microservices that get executed. Every time you load up a mobile app, there is 13 external services that get executed. The latter stat is from Martin Casado, the former stat is from someone at Uber. So when you think about an application and the decomposition of application to microservices, and you think about the dependency of those microservices on third parties, it is a very, very fragmented world, and it's, it's something that uh, the focus now shifts from being able to actually develop to be able to operationalize the complexity associated with the development choices you've made. So it's a very exciting time for developers, but it's also a very scary time because your reputation is as good as the last experience that you offered your end consumer, and uh, it can sometimes take a dive on a minute-by-minute -minute basis on Twitter. No, I agree. I think that, with what, as you point out, uh, the developers as a service kind of business is a very different model than what we used to do before. Uh, the life of a developer was much easier, nicer, and fun. Uh, no longer that's the case, right? So I think you have a lot more expectations from the development teams, right? So I mean, one of the, probably the last question before we open it up, uh, ties to the, the organizational and operational implications. You know, you've had a fascinating career at Oracle, and now a very different lens at, uh, at Google. Um, what's, what's different about the environment that uh, Google is building out for, and what are you hearing from both CIOs and developers as to perhaps the problems they need to solve? You know, I think the organizationally, no doubt, as I said, uh, the development teams have changed drastically. This idea of like uh, this waterfall or where you start with one thing, give it to somebody else, and then they cooperate it, and then somebody else kind of tests it and delivers it, has changed drastically, right? So nowadays, there are a lot more, uh, lot more uh, distributed organizations, but also a lot more connectivity in terms of knowing exactly what dependencies you have and how would you operate all the stuff. So at Google, for example, there's a huge amount of uh, investment in SRE, right? Site Reliability Engineering and you want the high uh, availability performance, but also kind of visibility in terms of what can go wrong and what would not, and how do you operate against that principles. Because the expectations from customers and any of the services, the, whether they, what you would expect from consumer services, which is always on usually, you would expect now from enterprise services. And uh, there's a lot more understanding of uh, what it takes to run that and how would you operate it. And then you need to bring in those kind of folks uh, and talent to really kind of scale that out. So uh, be able to run a distributed uh, environment, be able to kind of run multiple data centers, and you have operational uh, requirements across them and be all available at the same time everywhere. And rolling out services on a regular basis, I think it's a big, big change. And uh, of course, Google has been doing that for consumer services, now bringing that kind of mindset for enterprise services. And there's, when you bring in enterprise services, you're also now needing connectivity to a lot of backend systems, which customers might be running themselves. Yeah. So their, their, their architectures are very, a uh, lot of differences and very heterogeneous. And how do you connect that and provide uh, visibility into that while you're modernizing the stack on top of it? And that's the complexity which we have to address. Yeah. Makes sense. So I think we said we'd probably split it between prepared remarks and Q&A. So happy to address any questions that may exist. If not, uh, allow me to catch the local basketball scores on, uh, on the local news at 5.30. So. I think the question was basically uh, seeing good things about Google Cloud, which is great because I joined. Uh, but sorry, do you, uh, <laughs> sorry, just do you work at Google? <laughs> we'll talk later. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> No, but about healthcare specifically, I think uh, about how healthcare records are moving to the cloud, specifically what we're doing with Mayo Clinic. I think a few things, uh, which w the reason why we're working with Mayo Clinic as well as Mayo Clinic working with Google Cloud is uh, we have invested heavily in, uh, no doubt, AIML. 
So be able to introspect data and be able to kind of give a lot more insights in some of the research they're doing at Mayo Clinic is really important to them. And we provide a lot of expertise in terms of model building and providing that as a service versus just technology they can just take, somebody has to figure out. So that's an, been a big, big need for them. Second thing is I think the investment we're making is the idea of multi-cloud and hybrid. Because we do understand that many of the large enterprises and, and companies in healthcare have a lot of data residency, privacy, regulatory requirements. And you can't run everything in a public cloud environment, right? So how do you provide them the value of a cloud technology but have the flexibility of deployment? So you can choose where you want to run this technology, but you're still getting the value of the investments we made in the public cloud kind of technologies at least. So they're loving that idea that I can run this wherever I choose to. I can move that workload when, if I choose to move it somewhere else. And it doesn't have to be Google Cloud either. You can run it on your private cloud. You can run it on AWS. You can run it on Azure if you choose to. But we give you the abstraction from the infrastructure. So you are not tying yourself natively to infrastructure, which gives you the ability to be flexible and saves you a lot more angst in the future when a vendor would otherwise kind of gouge you on prices if you have no other option to go to. So th that's kind of some of the things we're seeing from uh, healthcare companies. And of course, we do a lot of work in uh, security and data encryption and all kind of stuff, which is expected with anything we do anyway. But beyond that, all these other things we're doing, which is helping a lot. Yeah, so the question was, um, what's, uh, what's the transition been like from uh, a model based on hardware to a model uh, I would say that is more modern. So we started that journey about two and a half years ago, um, and we're not the only ones, right? So from a pure software basis, I think people talk about Adobe, they talk about Microsoft, and probably the company that's more like us uh, over the last little while is probably Nutanix, from hardware to software and then software to recurring. Look, fundamentally, when we talk to our customers and our investors, uh, they say, why didn't you get there earlier? Because how many of you have bought a perpetual license for Salesforce in the last 10 years? Right, so in some ways, this is an evolution of the consumption model flexibility that customers desire. It's an evolution of the mindset shift in our dev organization that we need to drive in terms of earning the trust of customers at every renewal cycle. And uh, it's an evolution of um, the, uh, the, the principles of how do you uh, maintain uh, integrity in, in the software you build and, and what your customers deploy. Uh, so it's probably something that's going to take a while for us to fully go through. The challenge that we have is that our products uh, unfortunately work. So uh, with the, if they're at a customer and a customer has an affinity towards those, uh, it's going to be tough to actually get them out of that mindset. Uh, you know, as a company, we do 50 billion in revenue. The useful life of our products is seven years. So we've sold $350 billion worth of infrastructure just in the last seven years. You can back out services, obviously. So it's a long transition for some of our customers and to the point that uh, uh, you made around uh, some of the business critical applications that run most of the transactions for our customers are still sitting on mainframes. So I think we just need to be cognizant that while we may have a desire to move towards a model that may be embraced more rapidly uh, in, in this local environment. You've got parts of our customer base um, that, uh, that may have a slightly more protracted process. But it's going well so far. We're excited by it. Yeah, yeah, and I think the question basically is like how an ISV basically would run that in, in Google Cloud, right? And no, no, no doubt, that's a big, big business for us. Uh, we have a lot of large ISVs, and uh, some of them are public, of course, and uh, who are running their services in a multi-tenant way or in a, in a way where they might be doing it for per, per individual customers, but they pretty much run that as a full-fetched service on top of Google Cloud, and we provide them the data isolation and all the security models around it, but they own the data in terms of what they have access to, and the customer's data inside that ISV's data, uh, environment is also a customer's data. So they have ability to segregate duty, segregate the data, as well as the ability to kind of manage those systems in a very, very uh, flexible way as well. So this is very common architecture, and it's a pretty typical uh, use case. Yeah, I think we usually probably, when we talk about broadly, uh, the pitch is usually to enterprise customers. The ISV, there's a whole group of people who do that discussions with the tech partners. And there's a huge amount of effort for working with those tech partners because there's a lot more, there are multiple things to do. We, want, we, we do provide them the architecture to run it. Plus also we do a commercial agreement where we would be able to even bill for them. Or as well as we could be able to do like the use uh, Google credits to kind of consume some of those ISV applications as well. So there's a lot more different relationship than if you would be going and selling to an, uh, uh, just a customer directly. So there's a huge amount of effort which goes in beyond that, uh, beyond the typical selling process. So I'll, uh, 
I'll preface this by saying Edge represents the hopes and aspirations of every company that missed the cloud. So, um, all right, Amit, over to you. <laughs> that, that's why we don't invest in it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> No, I think, look, it's, uh, the qu I, th I think the question's valid. And, and we go through these pendulum cycles in computing, right, from centralized to decentralized to centralized. I think just from our, just the headline for us is there is going to be a class of use cases for which da data locality matters. And there's going to be a drift in computing cycles where you basically have computing nodes set up everywhere data is generated or where you need local inference. And we're believers in that. Uh, I think we're still, uh, I think Arif has a quote on the Fabrics website, which is they are in discovery mode as investors of what those use cases are. And as a company, we will probably be one step behind the investors in terms of thinking through what the markets are. And, and for us as well, I think it, there's a huge amount of investment as well as research which goes into that both areas. Uh, IoT specifically, we have a lot of solutions in there. So instead of just providing set of technologies you can use, there are specific IoT solutions by industry. So it's kind of still using the common technologies we build for cloud, but now it's doing specific maybe analytics or connectivity to proprietary uh, uh, kind of networking tech, uh, requirements by a particular industry. Those kind of things we provide as well. Right. So I'll, I'll address it. I was actually in Southern California when Amazon announced Sidewalk. Um, and so I think, look, we, as a company, uh, whether it's Google or, or it's Amazon, everything they do, there is, there's a lot of method behind that. Uh, and I think they're very deterministic with regards to what the end game is, and they have a long investment cycle. Um, what's unclear is why they felt they needed to do a derivative of the cellular standard to effectively accomplish what they needed to, uh, but that, I think, will become more transparent in, in due course. Um, I think as a general concept, it's a reflection of the fact that there will always be multiple technology choices you can make to accomplish what you need to. And, and I always use this analogy. How many of you have heard of the slogan, we only make one thing, right? That's the, and I didn't just say that because someone mentioned that you, know, you can go into a BMW dealership and not have the credit. But the company that says we only make one thing has 17 models. So they don't actually only make one thing. They make 17 variants of effectively the same vehicle. And so when it comes to cellular technologies, I think of the last 20 years, and Wi-Fi is now 20 years old, it's in sixth major uh, incarnation. Cellular standards dating back to 1984 are over 34 years old, and they're dating back to five incarnations. There will be multiple technology choices to ostensibly solve the problem of how do you do processing where you need to, how do you do storage where you need to, and how do you impute an outcome where you need to. And Amazon's just taking a different approach.